morning. My name is Peter Osborne. Uh, I chair Remembering Srebrenica in Northern Ireland, and you're very welcome to this special webinar on Dayton, Good Friday, and peace. Thanks for joining us. 25 years ago today, the Dayton Agreement was signed 14th of December 1995 by representatives of the three countries who were part of the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. They were supported by the uh, government representatives, heads of government of many other countries, including the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, and many others. Not long after that, in April 1998, the Good Friday Agreement was concluded, bringing to an end 25 years of conflict in Northern Ireland and Ireland. I was in the room when it was signed and remember well the relief that agreement was reached and the hope about what it would mean. There are a number of questions that we want to address in this special webinar this morning about those agreements and about that hope and expectation. Have they delivered what people in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Northern Ireland and Ireland deserved and believed that they would? Has the elation, the expectation, the aspiration of those agreements been fulfilled? Have they built the peace? How far is there still to go? Those are the sort of questions that we're going to address through a wonderful array of speakers that we have for this webinar, webinar today. We'll hear from uh, Dr. Yasmin Mojanovic about the Dayton Agreement, and no doubt with something to say about Good Friday Agreement as well. We'll hear from Dr. Maura Braniff about the Good Friday Agreement, and no doubt she'll have something to say about Dayton. We have an excellent panel with people and representatives from both Bosnia-Herzegovina and here in Northern Ireland and Ireland, where I'm speaking to you from today. We have Bosnia-Herzegovina MP, Lorna Pirlich, who's the Vice President of the Social Democratic Party. We have the Director of Remembering Srebrenica in Bosnia, Elmina Kulerzic. And we have two representatives of the Northern Ireland Assembly from the Ulster Unionist Party. Uh, we have Doug Beattie, who also was a peacekeeper in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the 1990s, earning a special meritorious award. And we have Declan Kearney, National Chairperson of Sinn Féin, who's also a member of government of the power sharing cross community government in Northern Ireland. And towards the end, we'll hear from Manira Zibersic, the president of the Mothers of Srebrenica and Zepa. We'd like you to play your part as well. We want you to say whatever you want on social media, but if you do, please use the hashtag Dayton GFA Peace so that we can see what's said and hopefully circulate further what you do say. But also at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A and chat function. Please do ask questions or make any points that you want to make as we go through the session. And we'll do our best to make sure those questions are asked of the panel. But first, to lead off the webinar, we have Lord um, Bourne of Aberystwyth. I don't think there's any better person who can lead off a webinar like this. Nick Bourne, for three years, was Minister for Faith in the Department of Local Government and Communities, and also served as a Minister in the Welsh Office and the Northern Ireland Office, as well as being President of Remembering Srebrenica. Delighted that he can join us and lead off this webinar to put it into context. Lord Bourne of Aberystwyth. Peter, thank you so, so very much. And uh, greetings to uh, those, those over in uh, Northern Ireland. And Peter, you've done an enormous amount, I know, towards peace in Northern Ireland, as well as the great work you do for remembering Srebrenica. So it's uh, thanks twice over for that. Um, this is a, a gathering of people who really know what they're talking about. So I'm going to be very wary of saying too much, except what an excellent panel we've got. And just, as you say, to put it in context, it, 25 years ago today that the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed signed in Paris, as it happens. It was concluded in Dayton, and, and part of that process was getting the key players from the Balkans away from uh, their sort of comfort zone and having an intensive period of negotiation in, in uh, Dayton, Ohio, which uh, resulted in these peace accords, which, though imperfect in, in some ways, have helped to create the framework which now 
has led to the peaceful uh, situation in in Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, that is obviously something that was very very welcome. Uh, head of the UK team in the negotiations was Baroness Neville uh, Jones, who's a colleague now in the House of Lords, and uh, clearly the key people were there at the signing of the agreement: John Major, Bill Clinton, Jack Chirac, Helmut Kohl, Philip Gonzalez, and so on. But the politicians can only put it. Uh, can only create the framework. The peace is, is something that is worked on and helped to guarantee by the people on, on the ground in Bosnia-Herzegovina, that, that great nation, uh, which is now emerging from uh, the dreadful past and Sarajevo, clearly a city of hope. And there is uh, hope over there and obviously working to ensure that the, uh, the memory of uh, Srebrenica and the dreadful genocide that occurred is kept alive. And the mothers of Srebrenica have clearly been very central to that. Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement, and again, I pay tribute to, to the politicians here today who were part of parties, the Ulster Unionists and Sinn Féin, who came together to help create the Good Friday Agreement. And again, just as in Bosnia-Herzegovina, a very complex and intricate agreement. And uh, it demonstrates that talking and negotiation and compromise are the things that are needed to ensure that there is a lasting peace in, in these countries. And there are clearly great par parallels. I was very privileged to be a minister in Northern Ireland and to meet some of the people who'd worked for peace and continue to work for peace so that now we have a generation, more than a generation of people who, who don't remember directly the, the troubles. And that, that is something to be very, very welcomed. And I'm glad that the work in Northern Ireland continues. I'm glad we've now got Stormont and the the executive running again, which is important. Clearly, just as in Bosnia, has been an important role of, of the US and again, of Bill Clinton in that process and an important role for civic society. There wouldn't have been these peace agreements if collectively good people had not seen that building a better tomorrow is more important than settling old scores. Uh, as I say, I came to love my time as a minister in Northern Ireland, meeting wonderful people of both traditions across Northern Ireland. Uh, just as visiting Bosnia-Herzegovina as Minister for Faith and now as President of Remembering Srebrenica has uh, helped to see that, that the, the progress that has been made in that part of the Balkans and that great city of Sarajevo and uh, building for the future. So it's ultimately, um, I think, people who would deliver the peace that uh, helps us in these situations, civil society, politicians can settle a framework, create a framework which can be built upon, but it's ultimately the good people of these countries who have suffered dreadfully, but who are now hope, helping to uh, secure the peace, the lasting peace and progress that still needs to be made. I know both in Northern Ireland and, and the whole island of Ireland and in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Thank you very much for this webinar, very timely, and I feel very privileged to be uh, introducing the, the speakers. Thank you, Peter. Lord Bourne, uh, Nick, thank you very much indeed for starting off this webinar and, and equally thank you for all that you do, not just in remembering Srebrenica, but uh, for supporting those people on the ground who are doing their best to build relationships and support peace building here and elsewhere in the world. Thank you, Lord Bourne. Now let's hear about the Dayton Agreement. We have joining us through a video, Dr. Yasmin Mijanovic. Yasmin is a political scientist specializing in Southeastern Europe and international affairs and the politics of post-conflict and post-authoritarian democratization. That's easy for me to say. He is a host of the podcast, Sarajevo Calling, and the author of Hunger and Fury, The Crisis of Democracy in the Balkans. Let's hear from Dr. Yasmin Mijanovic. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yasmin Mianovich. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from sunny Southern California. 
Uh, I want to begin by thanking the organizers for their invitation and also especially for their accommodation, uh, which is part of the reason why I'm fortunately unable to attend the event live or as live as anything gets these days. Um, I'm especially grateful to Amna and Elmina for uh, a lot of their assistance in, in making this um, appearance possible uh, despite some uh, technical issues and, and um, planning issues on my end. So my sincere apologies and my gratitude to, to the entire team and organization of Remembering Skevinitsa and of course to all of you for being here. Um, I'll preface my comments today by saying that I am a political scientist. Uh, I am Bosnian among other things, uh, but I'm a political scientist and, and one of the sort of specific areas of research which I work on or have worked on in the past um, is the role of agreements and uh, of frameworks like the Dayton Constitutional Order and the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and the interplay between those kinds of peace agreements and democracy, or perhaps more accurately, democratization. And the basic question that, that I think all researchers in this field ask themselves is, what is the primary objective of these agreements, right? What do they attempt to achieve? And I think we would not be telling the truth if we did not acknowledge that in many ways the alpha and omega, as it were, of these kinds of agreements, and we can talk about um, similar pacts, for instance, uh, you know, places like the Lebanon, these are often the three sort of main comparative areas study, right? Northern Ireland, um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and, and Lebanon. Um, and, you know, there's a few other places that we can mention, Cyprus, et cetera, et cetera. But these three polities have these kind of binding framing agreements that um, categorically shape their politics. And the alpha and omega of these agreements, of course, is peace. Right, that is the primary deliverable, to use a nice policy term, right? Uh, that is the primary deliverable that these, that these agreements provide. And if you're talking about a place like Bosnia-Herzegovina that experienced genocide, that experienced large scale human rights atrocities and crimes against humanity that saw the deaths of nearly 100,000 people in a very short amount of time. And you kind of wind back the mental clock to, you know, the winter of 1995, 1996, uh, peace is a good unto itself. Anyone who lived through the troubles uh, uh, in Northern Ireland, I think anyone who lived through the Civil War in Lebanon, peace is a good unto itself. And it's very difficult to argue against the centrality and the primacy of peace from that standpoint. The problem, of course, is that time goes on. And with time, that alpha and omega loses its luster. Um, for the generations that have been born in a place like Bosnia after the genocide and after the war, Dayton has progressively lost its appeal, if for no other reason than they have no lived memory or experience of the horror of the war. But what they do have a very, very lived experience with is the, of course, other aspect of virtually all of these agreements. And that is namely that they functionally are ethno-sectarian oligarchic regimes. Right? They have within them the uh, uh, mechanisms for parliamentary democracy, and that's certainly the case in uh, Northern Ireland, it's certainly the case in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
the case in Lebanon, all of these on paper are democratic regimes. But of course, in all three, we have seen that the ethno-sectarian aspects of these regimes make what we would otherwise, you know, kind of call robust, competitive, contested uh, uh, electoral democracy extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. In the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the regime is set up in such a way that basically, if you are not a nationally oriented party, right, if you're not an ethnically constituted party, it is structurally and mathematically very difficult for you to achieve results. Even when you do actually very, very well, the system is set up in such a way that it's very difficult to translate those victories to government. We have a, a colleague I understand from one of these non-ethnic uh, parties in Bosnia Herzegovina, and she can, of course, speak a lot more uh, uh, forthrightly and I think competently on that. But it's it's obviously a kind of structural reality of these regimes. And then, of course. Right, we get into something that when you kind of first broach it sounds like a highfalutin theoretical academic point, but actually is very, very germane to the lived experience of, I think, many ordinary Bosnians and Herzegovinians, including those of my generation. Um, you know, those of us who were kind of born in the uh, early to late 1980s, that kind of last Yugoslav generation. And that is, of course, the question of identity. And this is something that, uh, you know, obviously folks in, in um, uh, Northern Ireland, Lebanon, other places are also very, very familiar with. Identity, when it is prescribed in the context of these agreements, seems like um, a cut and dry thing, right? You say, well, you know, the Bosniaks get X and the Serbs get Y and the Croats get, uh, uh, you know, B and whatever, and here we go. Or, you know, the Shiites get this, and the Sunnis get this, and the Catholics get this, and the Protestants, blah, 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 blah. Right? When you write it down on paper, sounds great. In practice, of course, human beings don't work that way. Right? Human beings do not work that way. Identity does not work that way. And it especially does not work that way in a place like Bosnia and Herzegovina, which prior to the war, um, the Bosnian war and the genocide, you know, where fully a third of all marriages were ethnically mixed, right? Uh, uh, where there are competing and overlapping identities, right? Where there are people such as myself who identify very strongly as being Bosnian, but not necessarily uh, uh, identify very much with any one particular ethnic group, if at all. Uh, and all kinds of different permutations and mutations of that concept. Right? So we have, in Bosnia and Herzegovina today, a whole host of legal issues, constitutional issues, that are fundamentally rooted in the inability of the Dayton Agreement to respect and affirm the complexity of identities as they actually exist on the ground, right? So whether you're talking about, um, you know, what might be broadly referred to as kind of things like minority issues, which we can talk about vis-a-vis -vis the Savage Fincy case, or you want to talk about um, the very bizarre and peculiar way in which even so-called constitutive peoples in Bosnia and Herzegovina are actually uh, kind of the, the rights that are afforded to them are territorially contingent, right? So if you're in a, a, a Bosniak in the smaller Bosnia and Herzegovinian entity of the RS, right, you, you have comparatively limited rights as uh, uh, to your peers in the Federation entity. Likewise, if you are an ethnic Serb in the Federation entity, your electoral and political rights are actually limited in comparison to your counterparts in the other entity. These are very, very odd things, and they have severely undermined, and they have severely minimized the full electoral, political, and democratic capacities of the Boston state. And in fact, if we, you know, kind of really follow this argument along, and obviously I don't have time to do that today, um, you know, if you kind of go down the road and you actually start looking at all of these 
decisions that have been made by both the European Court of Human Rights and actually local Bosnian courts, in particular the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Bosnia and Herzegovina Constitutional Court, right? You are now starting to get such a large number of cases concerning identity, human rights, representation, um, electoral norms, which are making the functionality the basic functionality and indeed the basic legality of the actually existing Bosnian constitutional regime uh, uh, they're bringing it into question. Can this thing actually persist in the way that it has been set up? And of course the answer is no, it can't. We are actually, uh, and, I, and I happen to be one of these people who, who believes that this is already taking place, but we are functional in Bosnia Herzegovina today within a legal vacuum. Right, we are within a legal vacuum because the constitution itself has become legally and politically unsustainable and untenable. Now that's been the case for a while. And we have spent many, many years, especially those of us kind of on the activist end and, and many of the colleagues here at uh, um, the Remembering Srebrenica um, organization. Uh, did, did you notice how I switched the accent there? <laughs> I pronounce remembering and then Srebrenica, very odd, the way that the multilingual mind works. Um, we know that constitutional reform is imperative. We know that it is inevitable, but it is exceedingly difficult to um, begin that process because it is such a contested and tightly woven machine or more accurately, uh, uh, this kind of tightly wound problem, but a problem from which many, many people nevertheless benefit. The worst kinds of people, but there we are. So one last point on that, because I think we're in this interesting moment where we've seen some very significant changes in the international community. Uh, we've had this important election in the United States. Uh, uh, we are hopefully drawing to the close of many of the um, kind of most contentious parts of the uh, uh, Brexit negotiations in the United Kingdom, although that's certainly going to continue for, for the foreseeable future. Um, but we've also had these very important elections in Bosnia quite recently, and we're headed into another election season ahead of the 2020, uh, 2022 general elections. I think there's a moment dawning upon us in which the prospects of constitutional reform are actually becoming um, a little bit more likely and a little bit more plausible than they have been in the past. And I think it would behoove all of us, especially those of us um, in Bosnia who are engaged in politics, who are engaged in activism, but also those of us in the diaspora, in particular those of us who have an opportunity to speak to people in Westminster, in Washington, uh, uh, in all the relevant uh, policymaking and decision-making uh, centers in Europe and across the Atlantic. Um, I think we need to begin reasserting the primacy and necessity of this question. Dayton was, once upon a time, the Alpha and Omega because it gave us peace. And peace is always preferable to war. Anyone who's experienced large systemic violence knows that it is very difficult to put a price on peace. But there are just and unjust formulations of peace. And the more time has gone on, the less just, but also the less functional Dayton has become. And lest that itself become a new source of problems and antagonism and conflict in the future, which for those of you who have read my work know that I do believe that it might and has already kind of become veering that way. I think it's very, very important that we start thinking very, very seriously and initiating moves towards the creation of a genuinely democratic, secular, multi-ethnic, liberal regime in Bosnia-Herzegovina. One that will elevate all peoples, all individuals in that country and give them the opportunities to really create a new future for that country. Thank you once again for your accommodation. I wish you a robust conversation and for anyone who would like to get in touch with me, please reach out to the organizers and they will provide you all my details. Um, thank you so much. And thank you especially to the, to the folks from Bosnia-Herzegovina itself, uh, Kolege, Prijatelji, 
Boshtavani Sri, uh, who, who, who made the effort to, um, to be here. And again, my sincere apologies. Thank you very much. Um, take good care of yourselves. Stay healthy. Well, thank you so much, Yasmin. There are so many issues that Yasmin raised that from uh, a perspective of Northern Ireland and Ireland that resonate, uh, whatever the questions or whatever the answers, when he talks about a just formulation of peace, he talks about, is there a need for constitutional reform? He talks about ethnicity and identity issues and about a warning, I suppose, that for a younger generation, peace may have lost its luster. So many things to talk about. But let's pause that conversation for another 15 minutes. And before I, we, we do hear from Dr. Braniff, can I just remind you whether you're watching this webinar or whether you're watching live on Facebook, as many other people are, please pose some questions through the Q&A function, the question and answer function, and we'll put those questions to the panel that we'll hear from in about 15 minutes time. Because first, we're going to hear from Dr. Marla Braniff. Dr. Braniff was director of INCOR, the International Conflict Research Institute, and researches, supervises, and teaches on a wide range of issues, including conflict resolution, legacies of violence, memory, and commemoration. Marla has published a number of books, including in 2011, Integrating the Balkans from Conflict to EU Expansion. She's also, amongst many other things, for example, a board member of the Community Relations Council in Northern Ireland. Maura, thank you for joining us. Dr. Maura Braniff. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you to all of Remember, Remembering Srebrenica for inviting me here today and to speak about um, the expectations that are brought by agreements like the Dayton Agreement and the Dayton Accord, and also the Good Friday Agreement. Um, these, were, these were born in the 1990s and, and barely um, in the Northern Ireland context have we been afforded the chance to really reflect on what 20 years later has meant. And as we approach in Northern Ireland, the 25th anniversary of the 1998 agreement, this agreement that was was so watershed, it was so significant for, for Northern Ireland. Life has continued and, and we, we, we really don't find ourselves with, with the opportunity to reflect and to, to consider the ways in which um, the 1998 agreement has had an impact on us. As I was um, thinking about today and thinking about what Dayton meant for, for everyone living in that region. Um, in 1998, that was the first time I voted. It was the first time that I voted in a referendum. I voted yes, I voted in favour to stop, as, as Jasmine has mentioned, to stop the violence, to stop the conflict. Um, and I very much voted in favour of civil rights in, in favour of equal rights. And I think that, that this is something that, that we can see that threaded through the, the 1998 agreement in Northern Ireland. We can't even decide in Northern Ireland what we call it. We call it the Good Friday Agreement, we call it the Belfast Agreement. And as a, you know, as a first time voter, I was unfortunately and I, I'm sure I share with many of the people who are here today, I was unfortunately acutely aware of the politics of ethno-nationalism, of how space and territory mattered, um, but also of the role of memory of anniversaries and, and of, of the democratic deficit that existed um, throughout a significant period of, of, of living history. In 1998, um, the 1990s were characterized by these periods of, of, of excruciating violence um, with vivid memories of watching the Berlin Wall falling 
in a day and daily um, episodes of violence and heaping on more violence. Um, the news stories in, in Northern Ireland were dominated by events, not only in Belfast, but in Bosnia, in Iraq, in South Africa. There was acute human suffering evident on our, on our screens and evident in our lives. What we can see, um, and certainly it probably steered me into, into a career in political science, but there was a monopolization of ethno-nationalism and war. There was a significant dominance of that ethno-nationalism by men. Um, there was a significant dominance of within war of, of men, not only perpetrating acts of war in both of these contexts, but also being the victims and of war. And within all of this, we also have significant experiences of, of leadership. Um, we have the voices and the courageous acts around ceasefires, civil rights, protection and peace. And in thinking about what this, this anniversary means, this anniversary of 25 years of the Dayton Peace Accords, it, it's mindful to me that anniversaries mean a lot. Um, Northern Ireland, the North, is, isn't unlike Bosnia. Every day means something. It reminds us of, of those who we have lost and, and those who aren't here with us to, to talk about peace and to reflect on peace and to think about what peace means for us. The 1990s brought devastation, it brought destruction and it and it really harmed the places that we that we live in and that we love, but it also brought, thankfully, um, it brought hope, expectation, and also the possibility to afford peace, social justice, and importantly, an end to the to the violence that we all had experienced in different ways. Today, I'm not going to speak so much about. Um, Dayton because we've got so many people here who can talk about that but what I want to focus on today is the expectations and the realities of what the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 meant for Northern Ireland and what has transpired for it. What I really want to focus on is, is what we have what we understand as political progress, how we have built and we have built, and there's people in this room today who have built a better Northern Ireland. Um, I also want to focus on gender equality or inequality. I want to think about, and Yasmin talked um, and touched on this in his talk around intergenerational issues. But also I want to talk about in Northern Ireland, um, we haven't faced the past. We haven't dealt with acknowledgement. We haven't dealt with um, truth, accountability, or justice for people who um, were bereaved, injured, and, and killed during the Troubles. The language of the Good Friday Agreement is something to be mindful of today. And our political parties, two of our political parties who signed up to this agreement, are in the webinar today. Um, and the language of the great the Good Friday Agreement is really important to re-engage with. It did, our political parties signed up to endeavour to strive in every practical way towards reconciliation and rapprochement. They pledged to work in good faith, to work to ensure the success of each and every one of the arrangements established under the agreement. I think the people of Northern Ireland um, and the people who, who live here are very much entitled to, to challenge our political representatives on those points. Is the agreement about delivering? Um, is it about living up to what we signed up to in 1998, which the people of Northern Ireland, over 70%, the, the agreement was posted to every single one of our households um, over 70% of our population um, 
agreed, endorsed, and very much favoured the promise of peace that was embodied in that agreement. And what I want to reflect upon today is, is how far we have came since that agreement. Building agreement and a peace process throughout the 1990s um, was never going to be easy. There was huge risks taken in the early 1990s to achieve ceasefires. There was huge risks taken, huge political risks, but also huge personal risks. Northern Ireland is a very small place and, and it's testament to all of our political representatives for, for raising their head above the parapet and, and showing leadership. But what we can see is that in the 1990s and, and right now in 2020, we have deep political cleavages. We have a strong and very territorial and very um, visceral heritage of violence. We have a strong socioeconomic root cause of violence that hasn't been addressed. And, and the agreement that we signed up to in 1998, it does speak to, um, to governance arrangements. And, and I'm not going to speak a lot about that today. Um, as a political scientist, what I want to really to focus on today is, is the issues of justice, accountability, and what actually peace means for the people who live here. Um, we can see that Northern Ireland since 1998 has been replete with competing narratives. It's been almost impossible to locate any form of truth or, or information recovery or accountability from the aspect of bloody violence that happened throughout the 40 years of the Troubles. Um, none of those issues sit easily with the exclusive ethno-nationalist demands for power. We can look around both of our countries and um, we can look at our neighbours to know that the past doesn't go away. A line hasn't been drawn in either Bosnia or Northern Ireland about dealing with the past. In Northern Ireland it's been a very protracted process and um, those people whose lives were taken and um, were injured um, have, have really faced a significant process of, of, of obfuscation and postponement and, and silence around what happened to, to their loved ones. And again, one of the arguments I would make is um, in reflecting upon what 20 plus years has meant for Northern Ireland is that political parties, um, our criminal and justice system, and our governments have, have been very active in this process of, of prolonging um, the right to knowledge, the right to truth, justice, and importantly, acknowledgement for the people who, who suffered and, and died and were injured in, in the 40 years of history. I suppose my other question then, and it's a question that I have for anyone who's listening in today, and please do, do use the chat function, please do participate in this discussion. It, it's, it's not a discussion just for the panelists here today. But my question is, what then for peace when, when the past remains so present? The promise of peace in 1998 was something that we all looked forward to, it's something that we all were hopeful for. It signaled an end to violence. It, it brought ceasefires into the solid rather than the rather than more transitory. Um, it also, um, and Northern Ireland is very different, I think, in this regard to Bosnia, but it also placed um, a lot of ownership within communities. It it was a very localized an emancipatory form of peace building that emerged through funding from the European Union and Atlantic Philanthropies and a range of other donors really supported people who lived here to know what it took to build peace. 
we have um, a very strong um, form of emancipatory and localized peace building. And I think this is one of the key lessons and one of the key strengths of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Um, this strong intercommunal dialogue and leadership shown within, within our communities has been symbolic and it has been important, but it did operate within a context of EU membership where we can see that actually the border and the constitutional issues for almost 20 years um, became less important. In the first 10 years of the Good Friday Agreement, we can see that the Good Friday Agreement, it wasn't perfect, okay? It did stop the violence, it wasn't perfect. It was negotiated and renegotiated. And as I've said, two of the political parties that were involved in those negotiations are on, the, on this webinar today. Um, we had significant issues around culture, around constitutional issues, political tensions, disputes, securitization, policing, all of those issues were significant from 1998 onwards. Um, yet for most of the period post 1998, the political and peace process was, it was characterized by more negotiations, but it was also characterized by political vacuum. There was an absence of political and devolved administration. Northern Ireland even topped the charts on this front for having the longest period without an elective, gov elective government in a European democracy. Um, what I wanted to also say today is that peace building in Northern Ireland has been hard won and the ethos has really been about keeping on um, to learn from our mistakes, to share our mistakes and to share what we've learned um, with each other and, and to other societies who are emerging from conflict. One question I have for the audience as well today is what actually peace means to you um, and what peace means for your, for your daily lives. We have gen generations of people in Northern Ireland who have demonstrated leadership, compassion, empathy and promoted healing for the society. Um, I also want to flag that we have um, a couple of challenges that remain, well, several challenges that remain. The Good Friday Agreement was monumental, but it was very fragile. And the promise of that agreement was something that we didn't underestimate. Um, the promise of that agreement was very quickly underscored by two heinous and, and very violent acts. So we have the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Northern Ireland was, was not kind of wandering into this agreement with the idea that this promise was something that was going to happen immediately. In July of 1998, we had the killing of three brothers, um, Richard Mark and Jason Quinn, um, nine, 10, 11 years old. We also had the bombing in Oma, um, 29 people killed. Those rendered the promise of that agreement very clearly um, impotent, okay? We do have some challenges remaining. Um, the biggest challenge is really to how do we affix justice to peace in Northern Ireland? How do we think about um, dealing with peace and recognizing people's right to justice, truth and accountability? There is a bit of a gap between the expectations of what peace is and how people live that. So there is an expectations reality gap in, in these contexts that we're talking about today. Is the peace process in Northern Ireland socially inclusive? Um, is it, does it have depth and does it have a positive peace and reconciliation framework? Is it, does it emphasize social justice? Ultimately, what we can see is that 25 years, um, and I'm going to finish with this point, is that 25 years later, the anniversary of the, the landmark agreement um, is that Northern Ireland, like Bosnia, has challenges to face. We have post-COVID recovery. 
Northern Ireland also has post-COVID recovery in a tumultuous Brexit landscape. We have this decision by the UK to leave the, U the EU having a significant impact on Ireland, North and South. We're also about to mark the 100 year anniversary of, of partition and the creation of Northern Ireland that's happening next year. We also have the, the death of intergovernmentalism, strand two of our agreement, which was promoting intergovernmental relations, really hasn't gained ground. Aside from this, in communities, we have um, what has power sharing and, and, and agreement meant. We have significant levels of, um, of suicide. We have um, high levels of deprivation continuing paramilitary murders and attacks and displacement through that. We also have educational underachievement, which is linked, unfortunately, to, to poverty. We have persistent and growing inequalities. We're out of step with our nearest neighbours on equality, such as abortion, same-sex marriage, and so forth. There has been no reward um, for um, for peace, for improving poverty rates. Social injustice and systemic violations of human rights um, have been problematic. So I suppose I'm gonna finish by concluding um, that we have a lot of people working hard to build peace day and daily, and, um, and I encourage them to continue to do so. And I'll stop there, Peter. Maura, thank you very much indeed. That was uh, fantastic. And so many additional challenges posed to the panel. The past doesn't go away. Has social justice been addressed? What about victims and legacy? Acknowledgement? What are the prospects of peace when the past remains so present? Many other issues that Maura raised. We want to put those questions and others. We already have two or three that have come in from uh, the Facebook Live as well as the webinar. Uh, viewers, please do continue to put your questions and we will try to raise all of those questions with the panelists. Let me introduce the panel. Uh, La uh, Lorna Pirlich, MP, is the Vice President of the Social Democratic Party in Bosnia-Herzegovina, member of the Bosnian Parliament for the SDP, attended the International University of Sarajevo, where she received at least two degrees. Uh, Lorna is currently in the middle of an election campaign. Lorna, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We also have Elmina uh, Kolarzic. Uh, Elmina is a Remembering Srebrenica Director in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, has more degrees than I would care to read out, uh, but has worked in the last two decades on genocide prevention and education, conflict resolution, oral history, and survivor's testimony and has published a number of different articles. Doug Beattie, MLA, is an Ulster Unionist member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Prior to entering politics, Doug was uh, in the military and was deployed to Bosnia when the Dayton Agreement was signed in 1995 uh, in Sarajevo and also was present when the Starry Mosque was reopened in Mostar. Uh, uh, for his actions, he was awarded the NATO Meritorious Service Medal by the NATO Secretary General. And Declan Kearney is a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. He is the chair, national chairperson of Sinn Féin uh, and currently serves in the executive office as a minister in the power sharing cross-community government of Northern Ireland established after the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Sometimes there, sometimes it wasn't, but it's back. Fantastic panel. I want to ask you all the first question before we come to some of the questions that we already have. And I'm going to start with you, Lorna, if I can. Uh, Dayton Agreement is 25 years old today. Given all of the issues that have been raised, is it a success or is it not a success? Okay, uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to join you here today. Um, as you said, I'm in the middle of the campaign for, for the most elections since we are having it after 12 years. And uh, I'm also just two years older than Dayton Peace Agreement. So um, it's really hard to answer that question, that question shortly and precisely, since I'm the new generation that actually is living uh, the, the, the life 
that is subscribed by the Dayton, uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement. And what I can say is that um, generation of my parents who were uh, my age in, 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 in a period where Dayton Peace Agreement was signed were more optimistic about uh, this country uh, being a um, country of all its citizens and having faith in the, in the longer peace here uh, back in 90s, at the end of the 90s, than my generation is having now. And uh, for the matter of fact, uh, I have a great argument about that, is that my generation is uh, leaving uh, Bosnia Herzegovina like rapidly uh, in the last ten, uh, in the last five, in the last two or three years, actually, uh, my generation uh, left, and there's the number of hundred thousand young people, uh, highly educated young people, who are the top age of thirty-five years old. Uh, but what we have now is about dating this agreement that uh, people actually do not believe in this country anymore, and. The biggest thing is that um, Dayton Peace Agreement did make the peace and actually stop the war, but also caused this the thing that today, 25 uh, years after, we still still have people who do not who feel themselves actually as strangers in their own country uh, because those uh, ethno-nationalistic uh, policies are getting stronger and stronger especially during the election uh, years here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it's really hard to struggle uh, as long as the uh, Constitution said that this country is the country of Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks, and others, and not country of all its, all its citizens. So when Yasmin said that constitutional reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina was paramount, is that something that you would agree with? Uh, I will actually sign, sign 100% of, of what Yasmin said in, 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 in his speech because he's also a young person who can see it uh, very clearly about what's going on here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I can say that we, we don't have just problem by changing the constitution, but we also have problem with respecting the constitution that we are having now because we now have elected politicians who are not respecting the constitution of this country, or matter of the fact, they just uh, do not respect this country as the whole country, but only the half of it. So in the Dayton Peace Agreement, there is said that we have two entities. And now, 25 years after, we are actually fighting uh, to stop uh, to have a Bosnia and Herzegovina that has three entities. So we are, we are actually, uh, and, and now I'm getting back to, to, to what I said before, that generation, my parents were more optimistic about this country 20 years ago than I am now today. Lorna, thank you. We'll come back to you in a, in a few minutes, because I want to put that point now to Elmina, just to carry on with the Bosnian theme before we come to Northern Ireland and Ireland. Lorna, uh, many young people are leaving. Uh, Yasmin talked about uh, peace has lost its luster for young people in Bosnia Herzegovina. Is that something you recognise? Has Dayton been a success? Thank you, Peter, for having me. I'm really honoured to be here today. This is a topic that I think is very close to all of our hearts, um, and especially Dayton has shaped my life tremendously. I was only a child when the war started, so I'm a bit older than Lana, but a bit, I think, uh, younger than Yasmin, so I'm the generation in between. Um, and since I've spent the last two decades really reckoning with my own past, but also with the past of Bosnia, this question of has Dayton been successful, I would frame it in a sense, has peace been understood and will it prevail in the future? Uh, the reality of the beginning of the war, if you look at the referendum which was held in 92 and how the international community has recognized Bosnia, and if you look at the attacks that were happening at the same time, it really shaped the outlook of Bosnia and the international community. Yes, we have a very complex political structure. It is very divisive. We have the smaller entity which wants to declare independence from Bosnia and they are reminding us of that. 
on a daily basis. But sometimes I feel that we are forgetting the human rights aspect of the Dayton Peace Agreement. The government structure is imperative, but we have to look at the past. Uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement, I would say, stopped the fighting, but did not stop the war. The war for a specific political ideology of nationalism and territorial conquest is still very much present. This is one of the reasons why I always mention the survivors, because this is why they have been so loud and determined in seeking truth and justice since the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement. And as a survivor myself, I know that truth and justice is imperative for peace. It's imperative for the necessary reforms that we need. A peace that will enable us not only to have a common narrative, but to focus on the economic, structural, and societal development of Bosnia. So my short answer is, unless we can have a direct response to what happened in our recent past, more of our younger generations will leave the country because they see that the next step of having a constitutional reform is once again possibly a war. And if we are going to demand peace, we have to demand that the survivors are part of the discussion and the negotiation process. And I don't think that this point is raised often enough because the survivors have survived the war. They understand what peace means, that it is not a signature on a piece of paper, but that it is the process of acknowledging the past, dealing with it, and really making sure that it doesn't happen again. So it is also a way of making sure that the rule of law prevails. What we don't have in Bosnia, and Lana touched upon this, is a process of how do we hold our politicians accountable, not only for directly undermining the Dayton Peace Agreement, but also denying the genocide which was committed and fully and institutionally promoting historical revisionism. So we have to really look at peace and peace agreements from a number of different angles. Because if you look at the Dayton Peace Agreement and Dr. Mujanovic said it, you know, it functions on paper. But when we look at reality and how impartially it has been implemented, we unfortunately have these questions. It hasn't been successful. And what are the next steps? I mean, I thank you. We'll come back to you again with some of the questions that are, have come in. I'm going to go in alphabetical order to uh, the two MLAs, now Doug Beatty and then Declan Kearney. Uh, Doug, again, the same question to you, but does some of this sound familiar when we talk about, or when Lorna and Amina and uh, Maura before are talking about acknowledgement, about involving survivors or victims. But for you, has the Good Friday Agreement and your party at that time was the biggest party in Northern Ireland. Has it been successful to date? Well, well Peter, if, if, if you don't mind, I hope I can just expand slightly because what happened in Bosnia really uh, affected my thinking in, in, the, in the long term and certainly when we came to the Belfast Good Friday uh, agreement. Um, I, I served in Bosnia in 1995 from Banja Luka down to uh, Gori uh, Vakuf, uh, part of the, the UN protection mission there, which then moved into the implementation force. Um, and I saw how it all developed um, uh, when Dayton was, Dayton was signed. And I, and I finished my time in, in, in Bosnia in, in late January and, and went back to my base in North Yorkshire. And then in February, the Docklands bomb went off. And I was immediately deployed to the border of Northern Ireland, um, you know, to, to deal with the for the end of the ceasefire and, and what was happening again in Northern Ireland as, as conflict started to to ramp up. So I can see where I'm no, I was no geopolitical expert uh, at that time. I was I was a soldier seeing things unfold uh, in front of me. Um, I, I certainly can see how these peace agreements were negotiated and they were successful and they were successful in stopping people from killing and injuring each other. And that was the first step that we all had to make. Uh, and since then, I, I returned to Bosnia uh, in 2004. Uh, I, I was stationed in Sarajevo. I was at the Starry Most um, Bridge when it was reopened that same year. Uh, and I saw how the peace had developed in Bosnia, and clearly being in Northern Ireland now, I see how that 
Belfast Good Friday Agreement has developed in Northern Ireland. But the peace remains uh, fragile uh, and it remains uneasy. And in many ways, the, the war has been replaced with a new cultural or, or an ethnic conflict where it's a conflict about histories and narratives, where it's lawfare, which has replaced warfare, where if you don't deal with legacy of the past, it will haunt you in the future, and we've never managed to do that. And certainly in Northern Ireland, it's the anchor that is holding us back from being able um, to progress. The, the one thing about the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is it, it had the buy-in from the people, the people were in part of that and, and they got the chance to see it and vote on it and then move it forward. Uh, and I guess Dayton, with all its frailties, you know, created something to stop what was horrific killings, but, but it didn't really bring the people uh, along with it. My view has always been this, is that there should always been a Dayton 2 or, and a Dayton 3 and a Dayton 4, and there should always been a Belfast Good Friday Agreement 2 and 3 and 4 because we need to keep updating them and, and changing them. Uh, and, and we haven't done that. And we've left festival swords which haven't been dealt with. Uh, and where we have a five-party coalition in Northern Ireland, which is, which is great, and we all have to take ownership of that. But the, the reality is, is at times there has been a two-party carve-up, which hasn't brought the people with them. So um, the, they are both successful in their own ways, but they are creating other issues if they're not dealt with then um, you know it, it will plunge us into something I even worse. Uh, and, and cultural warfare uh, and warfare of the narratives and lawfare replacing warfare could be really dangerous in the in the long term and create vacuums which could see the return of of violence. So we always have to be really um, vigilant. Doug, we have lost your we've lost your sign. Doug, Doug is in full flow, but we've lost his sign, so we'll try and get him back. Um, but uh, and Declan, can I turn to you then, um, and we'll come back to Doug as well at some point. Um, some fascinating issues being raised. I, I can say, I'm sure I can say from anybody from this part of the world, there's resonance in Bosnia Herzegovina. I'm sure from there, when you talk about Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, but from your perspective, has peace lost its luster with the younger generation? How successful, in your mind, has the Good Friday Agreement been 22 years on? Thank you, Peter. And good morning, Lana and Elmina and Doug. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate in this webinar. And uh, particular thanks to Remembering Srebrenica to the, uh, to the Trust uh, for hosting this event. Uh, I feel very humbled and privileged to have been invited to make a, a modest contribution to the discussion here today. And, and it is very interesting to, to reflect on uh, the similarities between the Good Friday Agreement and the Dayton Accords. I suppose for myself, the great strength of the Good Friday Agreement is that it drew a line under decades and indeed centuries of political conflict here in, in Ireland uh, by taking a peace settlement and then establishing that as an international agreement. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, there are many challenges uh, still ahead, and I, I would like to turn to those in a moment. Um, and there are weaknesses, and, and, and I, I intend to address the, those head on. But importantly, what I think the Good Friday Agreement did was to create a political architecture for our emergent peace process. And, uh, and it, it based the political architecture of a power sharing administration, which happily today now embraces the five largest political parties in the North and sought to entrench core principles. So the, the core principles and they're reflected in the Good Friday Agreement text, equality, human rights, mutual respect, the need for parity of esteem between and among all of the traditions and the cultures that populate th this part of Ireland. And I also think to pick up on uh, a comment made by, by Yasmin earlier and then uh, commented on by Almina. In our case, 
the Good Friday Agreement because it, uh, it addressed uh, a hugely intractable political conflict that had its roots in centuries of, of war and, and colonialism. It established a pathway for how we could continue the democratic change of this society, which allowed also for the option on the basis of consent for further constitutional change in this place. So for me, these are the strengths of the Good Friday Agreement. But in terms of its inherent and structural weakness, the, the greatest uh, difficulty with the Good Friday Agreement is that 22 years on, it has still to be fully implemented. So we don't have a Bill of Rights, a Bill of Rights that was uh, integral to the agreement itself. Uh, we still see uh, very serious sectarianism and sectarian segregation within our society. So sectarianism as, as a, an important fault line in our society has not yet been eradicated. And uh, because some of the issues uh, that are bound up with the failure to fully implement the Good Friday Agreement uh, have never been addressed, those fault lines continue, they may not be as pronounced, but they remain. Uh, that actually led us to a situation where uh, just four years ago, uh, we ended up hitting a tipping point in our political process, which led to a collapse of the power sharing uh, institutions. And we had a hiatus, a gap of, uh, of, of no government, uh, no regional assembly for three years, uh, because uh, there was a fundamental disagreement over the issue of rights in our society. Uh, now, happily, uh, coming up on one year ago, we, uh, we managed to restore our power sharing institutions. Uh, but the challenges, I think, Peter, that remain are, are these, and there's a clear correlation in relation to uh, Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina, in, in this sense. We too have a legacy of our past. It remains unresolved. I believe that our past continues to be deeply contested because uh, the future is contested and the shape of the future remains to be contested. Uh, Doug commented on our political process and, and, and I see us having a peace process and a political process. Our peace process does remain very fragile. It, it can't be taken for granted. And I think that the crisis that I spoke of, which took place four years ago, which led to the collapse in the institutions, stemmed directly from a, a very definite strategic lesson which we must learn here in Ireland, in the North, for the future. And that is, the British and the Irish governments are co-guarantors for our agreement. Those are internationally binding, binding responsibilities. Uh, both of the governments were in default of their responsibility to continue to mind and to look after and watch and oversee our peace and political processes going back to 20, uh, 2010. And as a result of that, that, that set in chain and train uh, a, a series of events which, which resulted in that very deep crisis. I, I would like to think we're out the other side of that. Uh, we had a new phase of negotiation in 2019, concluding with the new decade, new approach agreement. Uh, that has allowed us to restore power sharing. I think it opens up a new prospectus for change, uh, which builds on uh, the, the work which has not been carried out by the Good Friday Agreement. But I'll finish on this point. We, we had a Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Since then, we have had nine subsequent phases of negotiation and talks in the period since, uh, leading up to and including the new decade uh, and uh, new decade, new approach document of January uh, 2020. So there is a saying uh, that peace comes dropping slowly, and that is certainly our lived reality here in Ireland. But I do believe with the right kind of resolve, that we're in a place now where we can meet the challenges that need to be met in order to open up what is critical now in our peace process, and that is to open up a new phase of the process 
that based upon reconciliation and healing, because those are the issues which we have never properly addressed. Declan, thank you. And we'll come back to you again on some of these issues. Uh, there's so much to talk about and so little time uh, to do it. Uh, that's part of the frustrating thing. But I want to I want to take up one or two of those points, and I'm going to come to Larna uh, on on the first. Uh, what I'm hearing from people so far is, and this is a very general comment for in terms of incorporating both places, we have a peace. In some ways, it's fragile. The agreements have been successful, but in some ways, partially successful. There are many issues that still exist. And I noticed some nodding heads when I think it was Doug talked about a Dayton 2 and a Dayton 3 and a Good Friday Agreement 2 and a Good Friday Agreement 3. And I'm going to bring in a question or two from uh, those that have been listening and feeding back through Facebook and directly here. Would the US administration have a role? Have they had a role so far? Would they have a role in looking at the next steps? Or is this something that can be done internally in Bosnia Herzegovina? Does it need a Dayton too? I'm going to ask a similar question back to Doug, who apologised we had to, we didn't hear from uh, Hartley as well. Lana, first, where does this go from here to make Dayton even more successful than it's been so far? Well, uh, uh, when we are talking about Dayton disagreement, I I already said that we did not fulfil everything which is said in Dayton disagreement already. So we first need to fulfill this peace agreement then uh, talk about dating to or whatever uh, but the thing is that um, we are a little bit spoiled let's say here in Bosnia Herzegovina because we were uh, really uh, interested uh, we were very interesting for the international community for the years you know and now we are in a phase that um, when domestic politician doesn't want to, to, to sit down and have a deal about something, then we point finger to the Office of High Representative. But again, now we are having the Office of High Representative, who is represented by the High Representative Valentin Insko, who is, um, people now are, do not feel that Office of High Representative as really important institution here in the country. You know, so now we are having a situation with when something big is happening here, uh, when we are, when, when you're talking to domestic politicians, they said, oh, you should talk to uh, Office of High Representative. And when you, you are asking the Office of High Representative, they are saying, oh, there has been 25 years. Now it's time for domestic politicians to solve the issue. And we had that in the media all the time. At the, at, at the end of the day, uh, people are just switching the program and they do not want to talk about it and listen about it uh, anymore. So we do not have um, that level of being really serious and accurate about certain issues here from both international community and from the domestic uh, politicians here. Do you think Dayton rewarded violence? Can you repeat the question, sir? Do you think Dayton rewarded violence? Uh, I wouldn't mind and I wouldn't mind answering to that question since I'm someone who is born in 1993 and there there are people who are much older than me and there are people who uh, are uh, historians and uh, people who uh, did uh, survive uh, the war. I was a refugee in the other country and I don't have a memory of the war so I do not find myself someone who can answer. Uh, to those questions, but uh, what I can say is that uh, we cannot target um, the whole nation because of the acts of some individuals or the, or the group of the people or uh, to feel responsible for someone other from, from acts of someone else. Larna, we'll come back to you again. I'm going to go to Elmina now. You admitted you were a little bit older than Larna. So uh, do you think Dayton rewarded violence? And um, is there a need for a Dayton too? Well, there certainly is a need for Dayton too. If you look at the history of Dayton, it does not sound uh, very much like the history of the Good Friday Agreement. We had the April package, which was initiated in 2006, and it failed. And that package 
at least from what I understood back then, it was about a decade ago, was supposed to be a form of a second Dayton. We also had the Butmir process in 2009 and 2010, which was also initiated by the international community and it failed. And I think that was a turning point for Bosnia where the international community said, the local politicians through the voting system, which is available. We do have a voting system. Citizens do have an opportunity to vote in Bosnia where they need to be responsible for the changes. Now, a decade later, since the Butmir agreement, Bosnia has not made much progress. And yet, do I think that we are looking towards the international community to re-engage? I believe that we do, but do we want a process where the citizens are part of it in a way, I think it would be helpful. If you talk to survivors and especially um, survivors that have lost their children, that have lost their husbands, wives, uh, we have survivors that have lost more than 22 members of their families. Some of them will say that violence was regarded just by naming the smaller entity Republika Srpska. It's that a majority view. I don't think we've ever had anyone ask Bosnians that question directly. It has more been it has more been of a personal answer than a historical answer. But um, I would always go back to the need of dealing with the past. So when we do have questions like this, has violence been rewarded? We can have a conversation about the, a process that was taken place to address this question. The International Court for Former Yugoslavia has done its legal part. We do have convicted war criminals, but what we don't have in Bosnia is the mechanisms to actually hold the politicians accountable that are calling for violence, that are denying the genocide, and that are simply by doing this undermining the Dayton Peace and agreement itself. So we do have some of the mechanisms on paper, but we do not have the means of implementing them yet. And Lana mentioned the Office of High Representative. I think after the failure of the April package in 2006, and this was also the time of the late Patty Ashdown, who was the High Representative, uh, that is when the international community really stepped back and when Bosnians just sort of understood that the bond power that the high office of high representative could use have not been used yet. So do we see that we have the mechanisms? We do. Are they being used? They're not. And this is where the younger generations come in. They're either leaving or they're trying to do something indirectly by trying to emphasize the need for uh, political accountability, really. Thank you, Amina. I, I'm going to come to Doug uh, now, and apologies for before your, your uh, sign just disappeared on us, so if there's something you need to complete with that answer, please do. But there's so many questions and issues in my mind. I'm going to ask you a very complex question, trying to get everything in. Um, we talked about acknowledgement. We talked about victims and survivors in Bosnia, as well as in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Uh, Amina, I think, mentioned potential of politicians to undermine the agreements. Uh, is that relevant in Northern Ireland as well, especially if, from your perspective, you think there needs to be a Good Friday Agreement Mark II? Can people trust the politicians to deliver that? But I specifically want to uh, also touch on a question raised by somebody in the who, who's viewing, who said, is that sort of thing not really difficult when you have a government in the UK, because international community supporting peace processes are very important in both regions, when you have a government in the UK that is more English nationalist with Brexit than supporting peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland? I'm sorry, Doug, that's a very... I, I think it's a really interesting question. It, it, it's a hugely complex question, and, and I'll probably skip some of it just for time because I would be talking for an awful long time. But I, I guess, you know, when I when I listen to what Declan said, and I, and I agree with Declan on, the, on this, is that... Um, both governments, the, the Irish government and the UK government, um, when they got the, the, the peace in 1998, they, they, they stepped out of it, they stepped back, they, they let it run its course, it, they, they didn't stick with it. And if they had stayed with it, they, they kept promoting and pushing and changing and developing, uh, we, we might not be where we are now. So that's really important. And when I listen to Alana, I think it was Alana who said that, you know, Dayton ha hasn't even been implemented in the first case. 
you know, there, there's still stuff in that that hasn't been in it. And, and, you know, you can see that the international community hasn't kept the course as well uh, in regards to Bosnia, although they've had a presence there, they, they haven't really kept the, the, the course. Um, but I suppose all politicians can undermine any process. Uh, and this is where it's really important for politicians to be open uh, and to be clear uh, and to say that uh, violence of, of any shape or form, from any direction, be it from the state, be it from um, terrorists, be it from paramilitaries, anyways, is not the way to proceed. Uh, and this is where we get into that that co that conflict about history and the narrative of it, where if we're mindful of our language, and we can all fall on this, by the way, there's nobody at fault particularly, but we can all fall on this. You know, if we're not careful of our language, um, we can end up promoting something without the intentions of it. One of the questions you asked uh, was, did violence pay? You know, it's easy for me to turn around and say, well, they got released after two, they got released without doing their sentence. So they obviously got something out of the peace process. And it's easy for me to say that. But if I switch the thing around and I say, well, actually the problem was the victims had to pay the price. And having the victims pay the price, it's important that we pay the victims back. It's important that we listen to the victims and we give them a process um, which meets their needs. So, so there's a real complexity here, um, Peter. Uh, and, and for me, that complexity is in Northern Ireland is because governments abandoned the system. They, they didn't stay the course. Uh, and, and when we did get a chance to change things, we, we didn't bring the victims into it. You know, we didn't have a co-design between governments uh, and victims. In many ways, we had a co-design between governments and perpetrators, and, and, and Declan might disagree with that, but that's a reality if you're a victim and you're looking at that. So, so I, I think you know, it's important that the inter international community really do step in and start helping Bosnia to deal with any of the issues that they have. And we need our governments here in Northern Ireland um, to, to not step out of what we have, you know, having, got our, having got our executive and assembly back up and running after three years. They must stay with this now. That was me finished. Okay, Doug, thank you very much. Your, your sign was starting to erode again there. I don't, I, I, um, I, and I, I, we've stopped hearing you, I think. But I'm going to put the same question to, to Declan. And Declan, maybe you want to respond to Amina, Varna and Doug. And the question is about acknowledgement, um, the issue of bringing victims uh, with us. Uh, I suppose also a question about the international community and in Northern Ireland and Ireland, that was especially about the British and Irish governments. Has that made it easier and more difficult with Brexit as well? Uh, where do we go from here with that? To go back to the point, uh, Peter, which I think is a fundamentally important strategic lesson of our peace and political processes. Uh, when the two governments began, for different reasons, to uh, disengage from their international responsibilities to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement was taken forward to its entire implementation. And I try to trace that back to 2010. Then we began to um, have an accumulation of difficulties, uh, which then found expression in the, the collapse of the institutions in 2017. Now, the Good Friday Agreement still exists. It has yet to be implemented. The responsibilities of the two governments uh, continue. So Doug is right, and we agree on this. It is essential that the Irish and the British governments remain strategically engaged with their responsibilities. That is, a, that is essential. We cannot take our political process for granted. In terms of uh, the role of politicians, we have to say what we mean. And then we have to mean what we say. And, and that's the function of political leaders in, in this period here in the North, where we have successfully uh, re-established our power sharing administration, and we have all five main parties involved. I don't think that the, uh, the political process, the, new, the newly found basis to our political process has been properly tested yet as a direct result of the onset of the pandemic and COVID-19, because I, I think that, ha that has uh, consumed all of our political energies and has not actually tested 
the resolve and the resilience of our political system to live up to the challenges which I mentioned. But core to those challenges is absolutely the legacy of the past. And what it's important to say is that we in fact did six years ago negotiate out an agreement on dealing with the legacy of the past. It was called the Stormont House Agreement. And all parties and the British government signed up to legacy mechanisms. And six years on, we now have a situation where the past has become toxic once more and even more toxic because the British government is derelict in its responsibility to uphold its part of the Stormont House Agreement. And I do associate that position, that stance of this current British government to the type of introspective, narrow English nationalism, which I think very strongly defines the approach of the, uh, the Conservative government, has done so in power in the course of the last uh, four years and has led directly to Brexit, which has now taken us into uh, a, a much more precarious situation with new headwinds and challenges for our political process. And I'll finish on this point then, uh, because Brexit is an existential threat. Uh, it has changed our political landscape. It has ramifications for the, the international situation, certainly here in Western Europe. But multilateral institutions and multilateral processes are essential in any peace building conflict resolution situation. I think we benefited greatly from uh, the assistance of some of those multilateral institutions that, uh, that exist. We, as, we benefited from the input of the European Union uh, from North America. But multilateral institutions and their role must be linked to a people-centered approach. And, and we do need now, not just to acknowledge the loss of our victims and our survivors, we actually now have to move forward to a new phase of our peace process, which seriously and systematically addresses the issues of healing and reconciliation. And that will require huge leadership, huge compassion, great generosity on, on all our behalfs, and essentially the responsibility of the two governments to support us all in how we go forward on that basis. Declan, thank you. I'm going to ask each of you one last question because we're out of time. There are so many issues. We could go on for another hour uh, with all of these questions and issues. And it's, I think what that says to me is we need to do something similar uh, down, the, down the line to have a longer conversation. But my last question, when I end up, the last person I'm going to come to is Lorna um, to allow you to say what you want and get out back onto your campaign trail with the election. I'm going to start with Omina. Where do you think Bosnia-Herzegovina will be in 10 years' time? Oh, tough question. Uh, since that, well, we, we, actually, we actually met in the March before this uh, coronavirus got wild uh, all over the world. So if you ask me like half year ago or a year ago, what will happen? I, will, I wouldn't imagine that this will happen uh, today. So I think that in 10 years time, we will be in a country where we will all be the same uh, in front of the law, where we will have country uh, in which we will trust in rule of law, in which we will change the political culture of politicians. And I think that uh, my generation is the one that we should look at because in the sense of changing the political culture, because the older politicians, uh, seems to make the political culture of politicians who are untouchable, you know, and that's why they cannot implement uh, the requests and ideas of citizens because they are high uh, over the top. And I think that in 10 years, uh, uh, we will have better country and that we will have country of all its citizens, no matter which name and surname and ethnicity or religion they are carrying uh, with them. And that we will have a lot of people who we will call Bosnians, Bosnian Willy Brandt, and who will face the past and, and 
feel respect for the past and looking forward for the better future of this country. That's it. Thank you, Lerna. Almeida, you got off lightly going first. You're going to go second now. Where do you think Bosnia will be in 10 years? I want, I really want to second Lana's uh, comments, but I also want to be very realistic. I think we have a long road ahead of us. And I think the younger generation and Lana's generation and my generation that we will have to be uh, louder, more determined and um, less afraid, I would say. Um, and that we have to have international allies. We should not expect the international community to resolve the problems in Bosnia, but that we should definitely work on having international allies and support. So I hope that in the next 10 years, the number of younger people will decrease rather than increase, because if it goes on as it is right now, I'm afraid that we will be in a similar situation that we are right now. But I am hopeful, especially with the current elections, and we'll see what will happen in Mostar, um, that we can at least think of a brighter future in the next 10 years. Thank you, Amina. Doug and Declan, the same question finally to you. I'm going to define you two as the older politicians that Lorna was referring to. But um, although she didn't say that, obviously, as she looks at me askew. Doug, where is Northern Ireland going to be in the next 10 years? Well, I suppose, Peter, I'm going to give you an answer. And, and Declan's will be the absolute opposite of this, in a way, because I think Northern Ireland will still be um, within uh, the United Kingdom. I think we will have moved into a position where we start to understand better what life is like outside of the EU. Um, uh, and I think we will be slowly maturing again. And I know people say it's a long time since 1998 to say that we're slowly maturing, but I think we'll be slowly maturing into a better system of government, which, which doesn't see um, mandatory coalition, um, but allows for an opposition and normalized politics. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I'm going to. I think you, you, your sound has, has dropped out again. Um, but finished. I thought you'd finished. So it was a good finish to your answer, even if your sound had dropped out. Uh, and I'm going to slightly, uh, for those that are observant, change the uh, question slightly for Declan. Where do you think Ireland and this part of Ireland will be in 10 years' time? I think that. Uh, for, for a whole range of national uh, emergent dynamics, international factors, we, we are likely to see within 10 years a new constitutional settlement on the island of Ireland. I, I believe, I hope that that will be in the context of a, a national democracy. But importantly, Peter, that new constitutional settlement across the island of Ireland needs to be agreed. It needs to be an agreed Ireland an agreed united Ireland. And it is imperative that at the, the very core of its political and civic institutions is reconciliation and healing. I believe that, that the, the institutions of a new settlement must be rooted in reconciliation. It needs to be a rights-based society. It needs to be a modern, outward-looking society. And Equally importantly, such a new constitutional settlement must be based upon a respect for and a safeguarding of civil and religious liberties and political rights for all its citizens, which respects every tradition and, and every identity on the island of Ireland. I believe we can look to a new future. I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. I think we can look to a new form of politics, a new polity, and a new plurality, which will embrace all of the different traditions, ethnic uh, minorities, and identities that currently populate this island. That's a nice thought to, to, to finish on. Um, and can I uh, thank all of our panelists for that conversation? Um, there's so many issues uh, and so many questions, so much to talk about, uh, not just in the past, but the present and for the future. Uh, and we have done justice to it as far as we can in the limited time that we've had. Thank you very much to Lana, Elmina, Doug and Declan.
Now, we're going to hear from Manira Sivrzic, the president of the Mothers of Srebrenica and Zepa. Before we do, can I just say a thank you to Doug and Declan, uh, because a little while ago they supported, amongst other political parties in Northern Ireland, the planting of a tree to commemorate the Srebrenica genocide. That tree was planted on the Stormont estate, and it was one of the few times when we had all six of the main parties at Stormont agreeing to plant that tree and remember that genocide. Manira Sivisic is the mother, is the president of the Mothers of Srebrenica and Zepa. Let's hear from Manira now. sam sela 3, od 2. do 6. marta 2020. godine. Želila sam da posjetim to mjesto, da upoznam ljude, da upoznam njihovu kulturu, jer u Sjeverno Irsko nisam bila, jako sam bila gotovo u cijelom svijetu i kad sam došla na moju žalost sam bila jako, jako razočarana, bila sam kao žrtva genocida jako iznenađena da postoje tolike barijere između ljudi, između katolika i protestanata, da postoji veliki ti zidovi, da ljudi još uvijek i u 21. vijeku ne kontaktiraju, ne idu djeca u iste škole i ono. Onda sam se pitala zašto, kako, zašto je svijet toliko podijeljen, zašto je svijet toliko nepravedan. Svi ljudi koji se rode na ovome svijetu imaju pravo da da imaju svoju kulturu, svoju školu, svoju vjeru, da se obrazuju, da se druže, da grade bolje sutra, da pogotovo mladi. Kad sam srela, srela sam u tih dana, srela sam i protestante, srela sam i katolike, ali nisam nikad mogla osjeti ko je ko. Svi su dobri, svi su topli. Želim pa posljedno se zavalim čovjeku i onoj ženi koji su nas pratili cijelo vrijeme i koji su kazali da oni znaju šta se i desilo u Srebrenci. Nažalost, ja nisam znala da je postoji tolike razlike, tolike godine i to sve. Sam bila u Sjevernoj Irskoj i oni veliki zidovi su me tako nekako darnuli u srce vjeru, isto kao što me je darnula i ova korona. Danima sam o tom razmišljala, danima sam mislila je li to moguće na kraju 20. na početku 21. vijeka, je li to moguće da 400, 500, 600 godina postoje te razlike, je li to moguće. Nisam imala sebi odgovora, ali bilo mi je jako, jako čudno. Pričala sam mojim majkama, majke moje ne mogu da vjeruju. Nadam se ako Bog, da kad prođe ova korona i prođe sve, da ću napraviti jednu delegaciju majki, da posjetim da dignemo svoj glas i mi majke iz Balkana i majke i tamo iz Sjeverne Irske i katolkinje i protestankinje i da kažu dosta više zidova, dosta više podijela, dosta više nepravde, dosta više dijeljenja ljudi. Mi majke Srebrenice koje smo preživile genocid, koje smo u genocidu gubile svoje sinove, svoje muževe, svoje kćerke, koje su mnoge od nas silovane gdje su naša djeca gledala kad im ubijaju rotelje, neka su se djeca rađala i posle smrti svoga oca i sve tu. Izgradili smo nekako neku toplinu našoj djeci, izgradili smo neki mir. Naša djeca ne imaju mržnu, naša djeca nisu napravila ni jednu osvetu. Naša se djeca druže i sa Srbima, i Hrvatima, i Romima, i Englezima, i Katolicima, i sa svim ljudima koji su dobri ljudi. A mi smo majke želele da nekako prenesemo na našu djecu istinu, ali da im kažemo da postoji dobri i loši ljudi. I tako smo uspjele u tome. Školovali smo svoju djecu, imamo jako, jako dosta djece koja govori dosta stranih jezika, koja su doktori, inženjeri, profesori i to sve. Ja često puta kažem, nijako smo doživjeli genocid, nijako smo doživjeli nepravdu od svijeta i Evrope, nijako smo doživjeli ono što smo doživjeli 1995. godine, mnoge od nas i silovanje. Ipak, u nama se ne budi mržnja, u nama se budi neosveta, u nama se budi nešto da stvorimo bolje sutra, da naučimo nešto iz prošlosti, da gradimo bolju budućnost sa našom djecom. I često puta kažem da čitav svijet i mnoge majke svijeta trebaju učiti od majke i srebrnice. Jer majke i srebrnice su u tome uspjele, izašle su ne samo jedan korak, nego su izašle 150 koraka u napijed. 25 godina je potpisivanje Dejtonskog sporazuma. Dejton je zaustavio ubijanje. 
a nije zostavio rat, a rat u ljudskim pravima. U Bosni i Hercegovini ne postoji puno povjerenja među ljudima. Trebalo bi grati povjerenje, bez povjerenja nema pomjerenja. I na ovim prostorima smo mi majke koje smo doživjeli, gerocid koje smo preživjeli najgoru strahotu posle drugog svjetskog rata, nekako pokušamo da nešto uradimo, da ugradimo, da ugradimo u našoj djeci ljubav, toleranciju, poštovanje drugi i drugačiji, da kažemo da samo postoje dobri i loši ljudi. I u tom smo dosta uspjeli, ali međutim još postoji i dosta. U Bosni i Hercegovini Dejton jeste pravda i jeste sve, ali se nije ispošto u Dejtonu. Hvala još jednom ljudima koji dižu svoj glas za nepravdu, koji šire ljubav i toleranciju. Hvala ljudima koji odgajaju svoju djecu u ljubav i u poštovanju. Naša su djeca budućnost, moramo ih graditi, u njima ugraditi ljubav i moramo naučiti nešto iz prošlosti da bi imali bolju i sretnu budućnost. Well, thank you so much, Manira. That's a very powerful message about Bosnia, Herzegovina and Northern Ireland. And if Doug and Declan are still there, are they? No, Doug is gone. Declan, can, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, yes. I didn't know what yes. um, Manira was going to say there, but it seems that if uh, your minister uh, and in the department responsible for peace walls and so on, it seems that if you don't get them down soon, you're going to have a delegation of mothers over to tell you to do it. <laughs> what, what, um, and just for those who don't know, the Peace Walls of Belfast, Portadown and Derry, London, Derry have been up twice as long as the Berlin Wall. Some of them are twice as high as the wall in Jerusalem. When are they coming down, Declan? When are you doing it? Unfortunately, I, that's not a fair question, I know. No, no, it's okay. Unfortunately, Peter, I don't have a magic wand, but if I did, they would be down yesterday. They, they, uh, they are symbols of the divisions among our people. And it will be symbolic when they are removed because I believe that at that point, uh, it will be a clear instance of where we have begun to move beyond the sectarian segregation that plagues our society. Uh, so this is the work of new decade, new approach, this is a, the work and the priority, in my view, of this new power sharing administration, uh, as well as advancing towards reconciliation and healing. In the short term, we must be engaged with the challenge of sectarianism and sectarian division within our society. And if I can just say uh, this as, as one last comment, it, it was wonderful to see Manira on the, uh, the call. She humbled me. She genuinely humbled me uh, when I met with her, when I had the privilege to meet with her earlier this year. And, and in July, because you mentioned the tree planting, I, I had the privilege of also meeting with Mevlida Lazibi and her story uh, has stayed with me ever since. Uh, the, the loss and the experience of devastation in her life uh, is something that all of us must understand uh, and then act as a powerful incentive to ensure that uh, as we have much more work to do here in Ireland, that we consolidate and build, build our peace process and uh, that the work that has been done and exemplified by the mothers of Srebrenica in looking towards a new society is taken forward. I wish them all of the luck and all of the goodwill and solidarity that they deserve. Declan, thank you very much indeed for those warm words at the end. And can I also reflect a thanks to all of our panelists and to all of the speakers, Tamara as well as Yasmin, Talana, Elmina and Doug, as well as Declan. Can I also thank the Remembering Srebrenica staff who have organised today's event and those of you attending, but hand over for the last time, for the last input in the webinar to the Director of Remembering Srebrenica, Amal Khan. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for sharing what's been a very stimulating and uh, thought-provoking webinar and for the efforts of you and Almina in bringing this all together. I remember Trevenitz is proud to have hosted today's event, which has shown how many issues Northern Ireland and Bosnia have 
in common after two decades of their peace processes. Issues such as managing diversity, trying to ensure power sharing arrangements in government to deliver for everyone, acknowledgement and dealing with legacy issues are as pertinent to reconciliation in Bosnia as they are in Northern Ireland. This morning's discussion has also shown that two decades after Dayton and Good Friday, there's still a long way to go for both regions. And this is a process which will take many years. There'll be no quick fixes and it can go backwards as there's no inevitable forward flow to the peace process. And radical transformative steps involving all of society and not just political institutions are needed to achieve the ambition of peace building and reconciliation. Can I thank all of the speakers and panelists for their insightful contributions today, uh, Lord Bourne of Amariswith, Dr. Mojanovic and Dr. Branoff, Declan Kearney and Doug Beatty, members of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Lana Perlic, Member of Parliament from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Amina Kolasic and Minera Sabasic for her powerful words. And finally, can I thank you, the audience, for taking the time to join us this morning. If you'd like to get involved with our work or find out more information, then do please follow us on our social media handles, which will be displayed, as you can see, on the um, displayed on the screen. On behalf of everyone at Remembering Shemnitzer, thank you once again. <laughs>